Hello and welcome to Project Noon, platform dedicated to exploring Hindu-Muslim dialogue. Our guest today is Professor Arvind Sharma. Professor Sharma was formerly of the Indian Administrative Service. Uh, he's presently the Burke's Professor of Comparative Religion at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. He is one of the world's leading scholars of Hinduism, Indology, and Comparative Religion. Having published more than 50 books and written more than 500 articles. Uh, thank you, Professor, for joining us and thank you for your time. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank you. So, of course, previously we had the professor to discuss uh, where we discussed the topic of uh, the need for religious literacy and how we might go about studying another religion apart from our own and the particularly the phenomenological method of studying religion. Uh, a method that seeks neither necessarily to criticize nor to convert, but to understand the other on their own terms. So going with this line of thought, uh, I'd like to mention two of the professor's book books over here. One is Islam for Hindus, which takes a phenomenological approach to Islam uh, and tries to, tries to understand Islam on its own terms. And the other is uh, uh, Hinduism on its own terms, which is a brilliant uh, dictionary and mini encyclopedia of sorts uh, on uh, classical and even modern uh, Hindu terminologies and trends. So going with this idea of understanding a religion on its own terms, Professor, I wonder, you've written a book called Islam for Hindus. I wonder what a book called Hinduism for Muslims would look like. How would Muslims... Uh, yeah. how, sh how should Muslims approach Hinduism because of because th these are two different or two distinct uh, frame, frames of mind or universe of references what should be the way to uh, go about this in your view yeah that's a great way of uh, framing it uh, Hinduism for Muslims yes right. so uh, One could, for instance, start out with the very idea of the prophetic tradition. Now, Islam belongs to the prophetic tradition of the Western world, that is the Abrahamic tradition. And the basic assumption of this tradition is that from time to time, God sends prophets. Right to instruct people in how to lead their lives and how to be devoted to God. So this is the idea underlying Judaism. And you can see the strength of this tradition from the fact that it is very difficult to identify a single founder of the Jewish tradition. Mm because they seem to almost accord equal status to two of their prophets, Abraham and Moses. Right. Uh, in the case of Christianity, it takes a different turn because while the Jews are still waiting for the Messiah, the next prophet, so to say, the uh, Christians believe that he has arrived in the form of Jesus. But Jesus also is a prophet. Continue the tradition of God sending people with his instructions. In this case, of course, there is a further refinement that God himself has taken human shape with the same end in view. Right. And then we come to the Islamic tradition which accepts all these prophets of the past. And so it squarely stands within the prophetic tradition. Except that here also there is a closure, unlike in Judaism, of the final prophet. Right. Well, as has often been pointed out in the Shahada, when uh, it is said that Muhammad is the prophet, there is the assumption that it is, he is the last prophet. Hmm. Though it's not stated therein that way, at least within the Islamic tradition. 
Now, given this prophetic tradition, we can use it as a basis for approaching Hindus, approaching the and trying to understand Hindus. Now, how might this come about? So we have a God and we have creation. And God then provides guidance to the creation through the prophets. So the basic structure underlying this is the presence of God, the presence of creation, and the third element, God providing guidance to their creation. Now, when we move with this idea to Hinduism, we find that in Hinduism, the revelation in Hinduism, which is called the Vedas, is according to much of Vedanta tradition, revealed with the world. Mm. That is to say, when the creation comes into being, the Vedas also come into being with it. Mm. That is again, God in a way is providing guidance. I'll have to soon modify this statement, but to begin with, God or a Supreme Being is providing guidance along with the creation itself mm. on how people should lead their lives. Mm. The point at which Hinduism deviates from the prophetic tradition is that is this version of Hinduism that it claims that there is no revealer. We have the paradox of a revelation without a revealer. And this then has to do with the ideas of creation in Islam and Hinduism. In Islam, there is a point before which there is no creation. And then God says, Kun, and the world comes into being. Right. Then it runs its course. And at the end of that, there is the day of judgment, the Qayamat when the universe is rolled up like a parchment in the graphic language of the Quran. So there's a beginning point and there's an end point to creation. Vedantic Hinduism takes a different course in this matter. It postulates or it argues that there was never a time when the universe is not in some form or the other. Right. That the universe is without a beginning and without an end. So because of this conception of the universe, it does not feel the need for a God to do the revealing. Mm. So the revelation comes with the creation itself. Right. So when, when we approach these two positions, they seem very different to begin with, right? Yeah. But when we go deeper into it and see what is the intention underlying that construction, we find that the same basic principles is operating in both the traditions when we make allowances for the different, slightly different ideas about God, and creation and time in the two traditions. Right, right. I mean, this is fascinating. Um, I have a, a couple so, of thoughts about this. Uh, yes, sorry. I mean, of course, the, there is uh, clearly yes, please. Uh, the uh, Sri Krishna in Bhagavad Gita, of course, also says that. Uh, uh, when when human society uh, reaches a point of uh, degradation, as it were, uh, the supreme reality or God Himself reveals Himself, or, you know, comes in the form of the avatar from time to time, which is yes. again you know very yes. similar to the prophetic model 
you know, when there's a need yes. for human society at that point for human gu- for guidance, divine guidance, then God reveals yes. through some form. Uh, yeah. But uh, just w- one more point, Professor. I, uh, uh, I, I just feel that. Uh, uh, do you think that there are certain? Of course, this may be the predominant view in Islam about uh, creation from nothing, creation ex nihilo. Uh, but of course, yeah. as you're uh, probably aware, there are uh, other uh, Muslim philosophers and thinkers who have also postulated that in, uh, creation doesn't necessarily mean uh, that the universe is uh, uh, was created at a point in time. Uh, that they maintain, for example, you know, Avicenna uh, maintained that the world, the world or the creation was eternal and eternally coexisted with God. And of course, this this was they were borrowing from the Neoplatonic idea of emanation, and yes. that those strains of thought, and of course, this is very predominant in many Sufi uh, schools as well, especially of Ibn Arabi and the and others. So I, I think with with those we have more uh, grounds for commonality or you know similarity. Yes, we indeed do. Actually, what happens is sometimes that uh, the main idea in one tradition is a marginal idea in the other, Mm. but helps us understand the other tradition Mm. because it is present in our tradition, even though at the margins. Yes, but I'd like to go back to the Avtar idea which you mentioned uh, because it is really helpful in understanding uh, uh, Islam and Hinduism together. In the prophetic tradition, God ensures justice in the world, but not through direct action. God acts through the prophets. Am I right? Right. Yes. Yeah. He sends his prophets. Mm-hmm. And some of them are warners, and of course they they tell what is going to happen. So there is the mediacy, the intermediacy of the prophet, through which God secures justice, right? Right. In the in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Right. By and large, we might make an exception in the case of Christianity in some sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Right. In Hinduism, God Himself intervened. So the idea of the prophet and the avatar has this parallel in it. The agency of God's securing justice in the world is slightly different. In one case, God sends people to depute for that cause. In Hinduism, in the avatar theory. God appears himself. So this is an interesting point to keep in mind. Mm. The other interesting point is a historical one. When uh, Mahmud of Ghazna had the Shahada translated into Sanskrit on his coins, the translation of the Shahada in Sanskrit was Avyakta Meka. This is La ilaha illallah. Muhammad Aftara. Mm. So, so scholars or people at that time also saw this parallel. Right. Yeah. Right. Which is, yeah, which might interest us. A fact which might interest us. Of course. Yes. Now, of course, the great stumbling blocks to, uh, from the Islamic point of view, towards appreciating Hinduism are two, the idea of monotheism Mm. and the the prohibition of images in Islam. Right. Yeah? Yeah. And apparently gods abound in Hinduism and apparently there's a lot of image worship, right? Right. Yeah, so how do we make these uh, these two aspects of Hinduism 
uh, credible yeah mm. to a muslim right. now of course the first point is an obvious one that hinduism is also monotheistic all the images we see are images of the same god so the real difference is uh, not between monotheism and monotheism but monoformism if i may just coin that word on the spur of the moment or god being depicted formless you know mm. and then being given many forms okay. or or perhaps you know if i can uh, say something uh, perhaps we, we can call it uh, i mean on, on the one hand you have a visual form given to it on the other you still have a form but it's an abstract form because even the islamic god has actually right? but there are forms in yes. other places right yeah but yeah uh, as, as actually somebody has put it very well we always think in images they are not always graven images right yeah. Yeah. yeah so that's one way of looking at it then the other way of is to point out that that really monotheistic uh it is the point of difference is not whether there is one god but whether you can depict the god with forms you know mm-hmm. yeah then of course there is also the country consideration that there is not that much of a difference there is a difference but it's not always great a gulf as appears at first sight between saying that there is only one god and that all gods are one Right. Right. Or in saying that thou shalt have no graven images, and saying thou shalt not have only one graven image. <laughs> right. You see, I think both are playing on the sublimity of the concept of God. Mm. If God is all powerful, you know, and transcendent. then one view of respecting this fact is to say oh we can't depict it yeah mm. but on the other hand we can say god is so powerful that god can be depicted in as many ways as you like mm. and the power is not diminished or compromised mm. so we are mm. both appealing to the same uh figure of god in a sense mm. with the same right. features right but interpreting them taking them in different directions right yeah Indeed. and the same question about no graven image because god is god creation is creation and on the other hand saying uh, after all the creation is a creation of god right? right and if you respect that fact then objects in the universe can of course not be made into god but could be used to remind you of god right the you know the uh... uh islamic notion of ayah of god ayah to ayah yeah ayat. the signs right. of god right. the very the very word ayah to be exact right and whichever way i turn i see the face of god right that's also i think of course from the quran yes yeah. and of course the another you know really mysterious or uh, uh, you know uh puzzling verse in the quran is uh he is the first and the last and the outward and the inward um of course oh, it's, it's right uh, there's a verse I mean, in in arabic it says the awwal and akhir the zahir and the batin the outward yeah. and the inward the hidden yeah. and the manifest yeah. so uh it yeah. makes sense to understand from an islamic point of view how god could be called the inward aspect of all things because you don't see him but to call him as well an outward aspect is something that is challenging yeah. for certain muslims but still yeah. it's there in the quran and you need to think about it what could what this could potentially mean Yeah. Yes, very true. Um Well, uh again, just to pick on something you said, professor, you mentioned that uh, in one sense Hinduism can still be called a monotheism, uh which yes. might be a necessary corrective for the kind of doubts that uh, you know, Muslims or Christians have about Hinduism. Uh yes. but from a more broader perspective do you think 
these terms monotheism or polytheism are uh, really representative of the Hindu tradition because they, they aren't indigenous terms. And uh, perhaps we shouldn't be thinking these categories about when we're thinking about Hinduism. Or can there be some alternate term or an, an alternate indigenous or internal terminology that we might be that, that might be useful over here? Yeah, of course, this is a very uh, complex issue because our discussion is being carried on in English. Right. Right? Yeah. And so now all, all translation is metaphorical. Mm. What do I mean by that? When I say Hinduism is a religion and Islam is a religion, we are using the Western concept of religion and applying it to other traditions which call themselves by different names and have different con mm. a different conception of what religion is. Right. Yeah? Yeah. So all translation is metaphorical. Um, right. And there's a limitation within which we work. Mm. But you know, it's a very interesting point made by a scholar. Uh, I think her name is Shubha Pathak. That the problem is, or the problem is made graver by the fact that this fact that our use of the English is metaphorical is accompanied by another phenomenon which she calls amnesia. That is to say, by constant use, we forget that it is metaphorical. Mm. So we start thinking of it as literal. Right. And then we start attributing to say uh, Hinduism attributes which don't belong to it, but which belong to the concept of the word religion. Right. But because we have forgotten Mm -hmm. that we were using it metaphorically. An example would help here. We say that so-and-so is brave like a lion. Yeah. Right? So uh, I think this imagery is used quite a lot in Islam, right? right. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So he's like a lion. Now, when we say that he's like a lion, we mean that he's like a lion in bravery. We do not mean that he has four legs like a lion or he has claws like a lion or he has a mane like a lion, right? right? But if we forget the metaphorical nature, then we will start attributing to the person who are calling lion, a claw, a mane, four legs. Right. Right. So it can become a, quite a serious issue. Right. Yeah. Sure. So I'm glad you alerted us to that. Right. Uh, there are uh, an analogous <coughs> concepts, right? To I mean, there, there's a clear mm -hmm. statement. There's a famous statement in the Shvetashvatara Upanishad, Eko Deva, mm -hmm. Sarva Bhute Shugura, Sarva Vyapi, Sarva Bhutan Karatma, Karma Dhyaksha, Sarva Bhuta Divasa. Sakshi Cheta Kevalo Nirgunascha is clearly what we call monotheism. Right. Now, there's the kind of monotheism which is which includes immanence or only transcendence is a matter of discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And and you might say that in Islam, God is totally transcendent, and you know. Right. And and Hinduism allows more for imminence. Yeah, all these questions can arise. But the idea that there is only one God is very clearly articulated. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, uh, yeah. uh, this also reminds me of the uh, uh, the distinction between uh, what you you also term in your book uh, absolutism and theism. Or you know, viewing the absolute reality as an impersonal, which is again you know a problematic word, but which we must use an impersonal absolute. Uh, 
and on the yeah. other hand viewing it as a personal god uh, and you know there are uh, yeah. schools of thought within hinduism that stand for both of these uh, options as it were right yes yes uh, but tell me what is the situation regarding this in islamic thought right so uh, one school of thought uh, which is highly representative of uh, the philosophical and the mystical tradition the sufi tradition is that of ibn arabi yeah. who was who's regarded as the sheikh al akbar yeah. right uh, the greatest yeah. sheikh so uh, uh, in ibn arabi again you have a similar distinction made between the absolute and this and the absolute reality and god the the person of god for example he mentions what he terms uh tawhid ilahi which oh, okay. is the the unity of god and tawhid wujudi the unity of being and the unity of being is mm-hmm. a reality which encompasses everything and in that of course the the famous philosophy of wahdat al wujud or oneness of being tawhid the uh, tawhid wujudi uh, again from wahdat al wujud which is the oneness of being uh the same new platonic idea that uh, the cosmos or the world that we see the creation itself is but an emanation of the absolute reality the ineffable reality yeah uh, which is again i i think much closer to uh uh you know the advaita view or perhaps the the kashmir shaivism view again because yeah. they uh it is more of a manifestation of god than an illusion that is standing between you and the absolute reality right so, yeah that's a very fine point that uh, in in the advaita associated with shankara there is an emphasis on the nature of illusion the right. illusory nature of the world and there is less of that in uh in kashmir shaivism yeah right. uh the way i like to understand this point is to say that there is a difference when we say the world is an idea and when we say the world is a dream mm. somehow we accord greater reality to idea than right. to dream right and and that is the nuance involved here mm. sure. yeah. yeah i mean more more broadly can we you know th- th- this might be a crude simplification but can we class this distinction between the absolute and the personal god as that between the nirguna and the saguna so this is the same distinction that ibn arabi is perhaps hinting at where you know there's god in his essence and then there's god that in relation to the world and that is the lower aspect of god or the lower yeah, yeah. now how how did the orthodox thinkers receive ibn arabi's idea right <laughs> well i mean that i think that that's a more complex uh, issue uh, i mean he is again regarded as sheikh al akbar but he's also regarded yeah. as one of as you know by many as uh, by many he's regarded as the greatest authority and by many as the greatest heretic so is, he has uh, yeah, yeah he has both the both both kind of reception both this case yeah yeah okay okay so the, the so the orthodox perception is that is heretical right to place something beyond god you know but tawhid e ilahi is the unity of god right right yeah and and tawhid e wujud nahi what was it yeah tawhid e wujud yeah wujud is the unity of the uh, manif- wujud is creation right yeah being existence being. yeah yeah being yeah right. or existence existence right. more better more accurate word yeah okay so he made a distinction between these two yeah right right now where does he place the sagun uh allah right <laughs> right i mean of course i, I mean, I'm, i'm no uh, expert on this matters uh, but uh, uh just uh i mean broadly i think ibn arabi's view is a non dualist view and uh, oh, uh okay and for him the absolute reality is ineffable and beyond 
form and beyond imagination beyond conceptualization and even the yeah. attributes that we think about god you know mentioned in the quran themselves only refer to god as god reveals himself in relation to us but the unmanifest god is always greater than the manifested god yeah so this kind of i mean there's a whole hierarchy of being as it were where there is absolute yeah. being and then on the lower yeah. level there is the you know yeah. Now, the interesting thing is that there is a parallel to this. Before I come to the Hindu view, there is a parallel to this in Christianity. Right. I believe Meister Eckhart right. developed similar ideas and for which he was going to be uh, uh, examined mm -hmm. for heresy. You know, right. He was going to be interrogated for heresy. And uh, modern Christian thinker Paul Tillich mm -hmm also made a distinction between Godhead and God. Right. And the Godhead was like the absolute. Right. But the situation in Hinduism is very interesting on this point. There's been a debate in Hinduism from its very inception on which of these two represents the ultimate ultimately. Hmm. The absolute right. or God. Right. Sagun or Nirvana. And this debate has continued to this day. Now, none of these schools denies the other. Those who uphold that Nirgul Brahma is the ultimate reality do not deny that he has a second dimension. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But they only say that second Brahma is Brahman, but Nirgul is the ultimate. And similarly, the thieves say that yes, yes, he has his Nirgul aspect, but he is really Sagwa. Right. So this is the position within the Hindu tradition in general. Right. Yeah, I think, uh, you yeah. know, broadly, it's also true about uh, classical Islam, you know, transcendence and imminence, both the aspects have to be equally, uh, you know, emphasized, but certain schools emphasize one aspect more than the other. Some mm -hmm. emphasize the transcendence and some the imminence. I think that's probably true. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, um, speaking of that, Professor, I mean, I'm, I'm really fascinated to know how uh, the Sagun uh, as the absolute reality can be defended. Because, I mean, I've, I've read more, I mean, just out of my own personal uh, limited reading, I've read more about the Advaitic view of, the, you know, uh, conceiving of uh, Brahman as uh, Nirgun. Uh, yeah, but yes. how can what is the case that, that they make for Saguna being the absolute or being you know being the okay, so, private, yeah. right? So the the, the case they, they make the case in a couple of couple of ways. They make their case textually, and they make that case philosophically, and uh, they make that case religiously. Textually, when they come against, they come up against passages in the Upanishads which call the ultimate reality Nirgun, they say only evil qualities are denied, not all qualities. Right. When the texts call the ultimate right. reality Nirgun, yeah, mm -hmm. it is not without any quality, without any evil quality. This is the textual part. The philosophical part is, has to do with the nature of consciousness. They argue that consciousness always is consciousness of something. There is always somebody who has consciousness. Right? right. And that consciousness is of something. So the Advaitic ideas are mere abstractions. Mm -hmm. You see, this, this is a very interesting point. For instance, we know Heidegger's famous question of philosophy or metaphysics. Why is there something rather than nothing? Right. The, both the Advaitic to the Hindu answer, the Vedantic answer to this would be, mm -hmm. no, the real answer question is, why is there someone rather than no one? Because without a center of consciousness, you wouldn't even know that something existed. Right. 
the universe may exist, but if there is nobody who can perceive it as such, can it exist? The way we talking right. about, it. yeah, yeah. Then the religiously they say that our religious experience is of an individual reality. So you know, there's a remarkable line in Ramanuja where I think he says. Tavanu bhuti sambhuta, priti karik dasta. Nice word, dasta, right? Like Abdullah, yeah, slave of God. Uh, dasta, huh? right? Dasta, tavanu bhuti, experience of my experience of you. The feeling generated from that experience. The love which has generated from that experience has led me to feel that I am your slave. Tavanu bhuti sambhuta, priti karit dasta. Now we can, of course, we can, of course, quote similar passages from Shankara, where he asserts his similarly direct knowledge of Nirgun Brahm. Yeah. Right. But Ramanuja would say that those people uh, who claim that you know it is nirguna have got lost in an abstraction. Right. Yeah. So these are, these are the three ways in which they defend their theistic position. This great defense is the Sri Bhashya of Ramanuja. You know, when he, yeah. he interprets the, yeah, the Brahma Sutras in line with his own philosophy. And, you know, speaking of Hindu Muslim uh, convergences, uh, uh, do you think, you know, I mean, to my mind, uh, the uh, philosophy of Ramanuja, Vishishtadvaita, uh, seems uh, to offer. Uh, a lot of common ground, as it were. I mean, again, with with of course, I mean, there are both these strands in Islam. There's a non-dualist strand as well, uh, and uh, I mean, the 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 pure pure non-dualist. And uh, again, you have uh, this idea of you know bheda bheda identity indifference, which is you know uh, you know which is uh, believed upheld by. A, a lot of the Muslim philosophical and Sufi traditions, but again with different emphases, I suppose. Uh, but my, my, what, what do you think about this, Professor? Uh, you know, potentially Vishishtadvaita being a uh, a tradition of uh, uh, you know holding a lot of common ground for certain you know mainstream Muslim traditions. For example, their idea of moksha and their idea of uh, again theism. Yes, I have a view. The view which you are now uh, articulating, uh, I have heard uh, stated by both Hindu and Muslim scholars who are very conversant with their own traditions that there is a very striking parallel between uh, Islamic thought and the thought of Ramanuja. And one of them even said, that Ramanuja's thought is very close to that of Iqbal, or maybe I should say the other way around because of the historical precedence right. of Ramanuja. Right. Uh, Iqbal's thought is very close to that of Ramanuja, as parallels, mm. remarkable parallels. Yes, so I think uh, your point is very well taken. And, you know, uh, another point which we discussed was the uh, uh, idea of idolatry. I, I mean, I don't want to uh, again use that term because it's highly problematic. And uh, I suppose no. Uh, I mean, Diana Eck mentions this in her book that you know no tradition would self-identify itself as idolatrous. That is only a term which a foreign tradition would, would apply to another tradition. So yeah, we should yeah. we, we shouldn't really be using that term. But what is you know problematically termed the idol or you know perhaps <laughs> more. more <laughs> The right. image is a very the, neutral, more neutral right. word, image. The, or the icon, again. The icon of the image, right. yes. Yes. Uh, the, 
I mean, there's there's a really fascinating, uh, you know, point I found in uh, TMP Mahadevan uh, that uh, you know even the professed iconoclasts are idolaters without their knowing it, uh, because uh, even the idea of having purely formless uh, relationship with God is perhaps impossible. And whenever you're relating to God, if you are an abd or you are a das or you are a servant and you want to have a relationship with God, with the absolute reality, then you have to envision it in certain forms, uh, whether abstract or visual or whatever. Yes, but you know, I think the Islamic tradition has been very conscious of this. I think both the Islamic and the Hindu tradition, uh, I was told, and you can correct me, uh, that the real, the proper translation of the expression Allah Akbar is not Allah is great, but that Allah is greater. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Than anything you can think of, was it? Of course. Any possible object of the universe, etc., etc. Right. And I believe that in Islam, uh, the soul is not considered immortal, but as being regenerated every moment, because to assume that it is immortal would compromise the majesty of God. Yeah, that is the Ashari view. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So there is this thing. Yeah. And then right. there is this famous prayer of Shankara that God forgive these three sins of mine. He's praying to God Shiva. Forgive these three sins of mine, that although uh, you are beyond words, I have tried to praise you in words. Although you are beyond concepts, I have tried to think of you. And although you are everywhere, I have gone on a pilgrimage. Mm. Fascinating. I, I actually this, found this. Yeah. Uh, right. I mean, I actually found this first in Houston Smith, who who quoted it, but he didn't mention that he didn't attribute it to Shankara. Uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, I, and he quotes it, and he quotes it. Uh, he actually paraphrases it. Right. I've looked at his. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it is attributed to Shankara, definitely. Mm -hmm. So there is the same urge mm -hmm. to preserve the, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, the 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 utter otherness, right? Yeah, but you know this otherness problem, we have it in daily life. You know, for instance, uh, we have this problem when we deal with space, because space is so different from objects, right? So we have we have this uh, iPad, we have this table chair, so they have length, breadth, height, density, right? Right. Now, we have none of these. Right? Does it have length? Mm -hmm. It is a breadth? It is a height? From that, we might jump to the conclusion that it does not exist. If our concept of existence was defined by objects. So it's a daily experience of ours. It belongs to such a, and, and also just to kind of uh, uh, emphasize the seriousness of this point, all things exist in space. Though space is not a thing. So we get into the same paradoxes, mm -hmm. yeah, which we get into at the philosophical level, at this very mundane level of having to deal with <laughs> objects in space. Right. Right. Well, uh, uh, before we conclude, I think again, uh, we should also take note of the, of, uh, the time. And uh, there's one uh, topic which uh, I'd like to discuss with you, Professor, before we close, uh, which is 
the uh, topic of religious pluralism and uh, what is the hindu view of religious pluralism and uh, uh, and of course uh, you know also the topic of conversion uh, you have a book entitled uh, hinduism as a missionary religion where you make a distinction between a proselytizing religion and a missionary religion uh, can you elaborate on these topics please yeah, yeah sure uh, i'll start with the last one yes. uh, i wrote that book out of my sense of bafflement that on the one hand we say that hinduism is not a missionary religion or not a proselytizing religion in all the objective views on the other hand historically hinduism is supposed to have arisen in the part of the world we now call pakistan ironically and from there it is spread over the whole of india and actually whole of south east asia right and although buddhism outdid it in expansion we do not realize because of the emphasis on buddhism how much of hinduism there was in indonesia and china Mm. So, how do we reconcile these two facts that it's non-missionary, non-proselytizing religion? On the other hand, it keeps spreading. So, the, I I found that if we made a distinction between proselytizing and missionary, then that would help us uh, come to grips with this issue, because Hinduism has not sought conversion. There are two points here. One is, it has not sought proselytize. You know, it does not seek to convert people. One, right. wherever it goes. And two, when somebody wants to come within the fold in some way, it does not insist that you have to give up your prior affiliation. so in a sense you are welcome the other other person saying come come yeah join the hindu fold but bring all your riches with you of your other tradition right yeah so so it has the sense of mission you know the real thing is about hinduism that hinduism is uh not uh a religion but a platform for presenting you with all religious options or as many as possible so whereas islam and christianity might say okay here we have the truth here we have the truth here you take it right hinduism would say well here we have the engine for the discovery of truth the engines for the discovery of truth now make your pick so there is this this yeah mm -hmm. right and because because its goal is to make as many possible options this is a pluralism point you raised you yeah? its goal is to make as many options available to us possible therefore it's always willing to accept the various scriptures of other religions you know mm. along its own the bible the quran and so on here are more options mm. so it's a kind of a it's saying no here i am offering all this to you at the same time allow me to take whatever you have to enrich these options it's a kind of a the game is game is played in these two ways right yeah yeah here is the cornucopia but i also want to include these new things you have given to us into the cornucopia mm -hmm. this is how i see it yeah, this missionary dimension mm -hmm. the mission is to make as many options available mm -hmm. right now the you... reason why it is so skittish about islam and christianity is that the extreme versions of these religions close those options right it is always open to them because they are also options right but it is very cautious because if you go the whole way 
then the very structure which is allowing you to make all these uh, offerings to those who follow you they will get curtailed right if if there is that for instance christianity arose in a religiously plural world roman world but its emergence destroyed roman destroyed religious pluralism in rome right mm-hmm. the only religion which survived was judaism because of its connection with christianity so now you, you get your answer i think to many questions you know right, right. as to his attitude to a why missionary why not missionary or in what sense missionary and then why not non why not proselytizing and the nature of religious nature of religious pluralism within it not just beliefs also practices you know mm. everything we call religious and this is complicated by the fact that in hinduism as i believe in islam also religion is the response of the whole of the human being to the whole of reality not just part of it right right which is why you have all the you know different channels of uh you know bhakti gyana karma yoga yeah not only that you have music you have dance right right, right, right of course you know yeah. right <laughs> definitely well uh, uh i mean you you mentioned at one point professor that uh, the hindu view as it were of religious pluralism is that every man should follow his own religion when well, perhaps i mean that that could be one way of putting it or i mean this this is what you mentioned in an article uh, on the topic where you say that the hindu view can perhaps be summed up as saying that all religions are valid and the validity cannot be absolutely questioned but it can be relatively questioned yes right. well so what uh, i mean yeah what Sorry. i mean by that i'm giving you a, let me give you a an analogy suppose we are both of us have our own cars you know and we are discussing how to get to a point a destination so i cannot question there you are right to choose your destination but i can suggest to you that this road might be better than the other right right yeah i think that's a good analogy your, right to achieve your own goal to achieve your own goal mm. that from from where i'm looking at this map this might be a shorter route right or mm. some way the more scenic route even yeah well uh i just want to pose one final point uh, that uh of course you mentioned that the, the extreme elements uh, and perhaps you know the, arguably this is also unfortunately the predominant uh, you know element in religions like islam and christianity that uh, uh you know it has this problematic stance about religious pluralism and this uh, you know hypocritical act- attitude as it were where you're allowing the you know quest for truth when it comes to your own religion but you know uh, preventing it when it comes to th- thinking beyond that uh but do you think there are there's also a possibility that this uh doesn't necessarily have to be the case that there can be an islamic you know universalist or uh, you know uh, view which for example you find in people like sayyid husain nasr uh the view of the perennialist school of thought for example uh, and and of course they also root it in uh the islamic scripture in many verses of the quran uh and they also find parallels for this in in history perhaps again as you mentioned these might have been marginal voices but there there seems to be a certain scope within these traditions as well to uh take that view no i've always been uh greatly impressed by uh some verses of the quran on this on religious pluralism and uh, uh i think the one which says and of course you know, i am i'm going to try to uh uh article i uh, recite i guess in its own way right inna jalnakum kauban shayban wa kabilan la ta'rafu ta'rafu yes 
Ah, right. Yes. Now, I, I found this extremely impressive because mm -hmm. God is saying, He says that I have created men and women. Right. And I have created various communities. That is, the distinctions among these communities is as fundamental as the sexes. Mm. So that you may know each other. I mean, I, this was mind-blowing to me. Mm. So if, if proper, mm. uh, proper recognition is accorded to this verse, you know, now, of course, I'm not, uh, you know, an expert in the Quran or the Hadith and all. To push the point further, I'm sure that people will point to other verses and so on. But at the face of it, I thought this was like, you couldn't celebrate religious pluralism more powerfully than in this verse. Right. Right. And of course, there's also the verse in uh, Surah 5, verse 48. It says that, uh, you know, um, to every community we have given a path and a law uh, and uh, uh, essentially every community should follow what God has appointed for them, you know, using their own scriptures and compete with each other in doing good works. Doing in, uh, in piety. In piety, And yes. as to the truth of them, it will be revealed on the day right. of judgment. Yeah, right? definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. I mean, of course, in, in many, uh, you know, places the Quran also mentions that if God wanted he could have made you all one one single community but you know obviously that that wasn't what he wanted in his wisdom and so the difference of religion seems to be a deliberate uh, you know intention of God God, okay, God actually I, according to one account these were the arguments given by Tegh Bahadur, Guru Tegh Bahadur to Aurangzeb hmm. When Aurangzeb, you know, asked him to convert right. to Islam because he thinks that the world should have one religion. Right. So he said, you are trying to achieve what the Prophet could not achieve. Mm. <laughs> and you are trying to achieve what God does not intend. <laughs> right. Which of course made him furious. Right. <laughs> I right. wish I kept that account. Yeah. Mm. Fascinating. So I think the basic point which emerges is that almost... No, in this book, I was searching various traditions when I was writing this book on religious tolerance and history. Right. I found that all the traditions provide for pluralism of the kind we are talking about. So it's a question of the relative weight which is given to this and also the historical period, you know, this mm -hmm. also seems to vary. Uh, uh, depending on political and other circumstances. But it seemed to me that all traditions offer us that option. And that could be a basis for uh, their coming together. Right. Yeah, I think that's a good way to end the discussion, Professor. Uh, we've almost completed one hour. Uh, but you know, just one final and brief question, if I may. Uh, could you suggest some resources for Muslims interested to, in understanding Hinduism or studying Hinduism, apart from your books, of course? See, for the modern Indian, uh, Radha Krishna, the Hindu view of life, right. is still the best. Mm -hmm. I'm almost embarrassed to say so because it was uh, uh, published. Uh, I think in the 19, early 1900s. Right. But it still remains, to my mind, the best first book. Because it takes the kind of things we are discussing head on. Right. Right. And in, uh, in very uh, in elegant English. Right, right. And very clear, clear, lucid prose. Of course. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, Professor, uh, thank you for your time again, and thank you for the brilliant conversation. Uh, this has been really good. Yeah, I'm glad uh, you know 
we are discussing these very uh, difficult topics, right. uh, but also very important ones. Right. In a spirit of give and take. Yeah. 